Secrets, silences, mysteries and family histories. Hello and welcome to this session of the Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival, where we're going to be having one of the trickiest discussions I contend of this whole session, which is talking about secrets in three crime novels without giving away the actual secrets. I'm Kate Evans from ABC Radio National's Bookshelf Program. Delighted to be here at the State Library of New South Wales in front of actual people. And a big welcome to the crime lovers joining us on Zoom, including those throughout New South Wales watching from your local library or from home courtesy of your local library. I should add that as well as being here at the State Library of New South Wales, we are also on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So let's meet our guests. Nicola Moriarty is a writer who's written many novels, including Paper Chains, The Fifth Letter and The X, but it's her latest, You Need to Know, that will be the focus today. Hi, Nicola. Hi, thank you for having me. Lorraine Peck has worked in marketing, casinos, painting and many other jobs before turning to writing. Her debut novel and our focus today is The Second Son. Hi, Lorraine. Hello. Hello, Kate. Hello, everybody. Lynn Yowett is also a debut novelist coming from a career as a writer and editor. Her book is The Silent Listener. Hello. Hi, Kate. Hi, everybody. Now, you've all planted secrets in your novels, but I think those secrets are different in style and even serve different functions in a sort of narrative way. But I shouldn't speak for your books and your approaches. So what I'm going to do is ask each of you to characterise the secrets in your novels. What types of secrets are they? Are they things hidden, white lies, secrets of omission, secrets hidden away? Secrets shared with someone else, secrets consciously hidden, or maybe they're suppressed or dug up by someone else. So Nicola Moriarty, it seems to me that everyone in your book has a secret. So give us the context and characterise those secrets without, of course, giving it all away. <laughs> without telling the actual secrets, yes. I think um, the type of secrets in my books are the kind of secrets that um, everyday people do have I think when you start to think about yourself as a person and every you know people you meet every day you start to realize how much there are under the surface of people all those little things uh, throughout your life and in your background that you do keep to yourself and you might not think you're a secretive person but I think we all have things from our past and secrets and so on and I think that's the type of secrets that I wanted to really get into you know I mean there are certain people in this book that you know we're not like them um, yeah some of them are, are the more nasty of secrets but um, yeah those everyday kind of little things that people hide about themselves is is what I wanted to kind of get into with this one. And that, in fact, is your challenge for the day is to think about the secrets you have and what it would mean <laughs> if somebody actually discovered them. Now, Lorraine Peck, of the three of these novels, I think yours is the most obviously a whodunit. And um, what types of secrets are you grappling with in this novel, would you say? Well, because my two protagonists, it's told from the point of view of Johnny Novak, who was born into a Croatian crime family on the streets of Western Sydney. Uh, so his whole life has been around keeping secrets. Uh, he's been taught to lie by omission and to lie well. And he's married to, you know, a nice middle class Aussie chick named Amy, who uh, who, who doesn't really know how to lie, but um, both of them have secrets from each other and, uh, um, and, and we really don't know to the end who's the best at keeping those secrets, uh, uh, but those secrets inform what happens, uh, I guess. Um, yeah. And there is a body by about chapter two. <laughs> yeah, there's a body pretty much straight away, yeah, which is always useful. But when I was writing the book, it uh, I wrote it as an action thriller from Johnny's point of view and my, my a, um, agent and then my editor wanted more from Amy. So she took over half the book and I felt that was slowing things down and, and I was told, no, Amy provides the psychological thriller. So there's an action thriller, a psychological thriller, 
and who done it in the middle of this. <laughs> and rather a lot of secrets. <laughs> now, Lynn Yowitz, whose secrets are they in your novel, I wonder? Because and I, it, your novel also made me think about whether secrets and silences are the same. So what's going on? That's a good point, Kate. Um, the Silent Listener is about a family that's, I say, drowning in lies and secrets. And so there are secrets that date back many, many, many years before the protagonist Joy is born. And that unfolds very late in the novel. But the whole, the, her family is just drowning in lies and secrets. So nobody knows quite what everybody or what anybody else knows in the family. And then there's this sort of cultural silence that goes on because, um, not giving any spoilers away here, there's some family trauma, domestic violence in the book. And so there's a lot of silence around that, the, the community kind of knows what's going on, but nobody does anything. And then I think there's also a secret that Joy has, the protagonist, and she doesn't perhaps even tell herself the truth about what she knows about herself and her family. So I'd like to think there are lots of layers of secrets and, um, and one of the ways people keep their secrets is by lying. And the secrets we tell ourselves is that's such an interesting element, again, I think in all of your books. But let's get a sense of your style because writing itself can tell or hide secrets. It can be slippery, elusive, a narrator can be unreliable or keeping, deliberately keeping part of the story away. So can each of you give me a reading to get a sense of your style and perhaps a few clues about the secrets? So, uh, Nicola Moriarty, you need to know. Okay, so this is uh, from the point of view of Jill, the matriarch of the family, uh, writing a letter. Dear Frank, I've made it to Friday. Although Fridays don't really matter anymore when you're retired, do they? But still, it's another week, and so it feels like an achievement. Another week of mediocrity. Another week of boredom and loneliness and insomnia. Another week without you. I'm being dramatic. I'm sorry. Are you sick of me telling you I'm sorry? You probably are, but I don't know what else to do. I don't know how else to make up for it all. I suppose in truth, I simply can't. Nothing can make up for any of it. No amount of Hail Marys, no amount of waffling letters, no amount of apologies, but I may as well keep writing because what else can I do? I skipped my Hail Marys this morning. I just couldn't be bothered. I was too angry but I will do them tonight before I go to sleep, as many as I can. I'll chant them un until I'm too tired and then I'll lie awake with burning eyes and beg for sleep. But do you think it'll make any difference in the long run? When my time comes to be judged, will all of these Hail Marys count for anything against what I've done? No, I don't think they will. I still haven't opened the bloody email. I did tell you about it, didn't I? Honestly, I'm sure it's nothing, but it is very odd for her to contact me out of the blue like this. And there's something so commanding about it. You need to know. I don't see why it's up to her to tell me what I need to know. Maybe I should delete it. <laughs> so that's Nicola Moriarty reading from You Need to Know. So how, how many secrets do you reckon you've embedded in that one scene? <laughs> oh, in that one scene, I suppose, um, I suppose there's a couple in there because there's this mysterious email that um, we don't know who's written the email. We don't know what it's about. Uh, she obviously, well, I think she does know what it's about, but she's lying to herself and saying that she doesn't know what she needs to know. Uh, she's, you know, writing to Frank and we're not exactly sure what's happened to Frank at this point in the book and why she's writing to him. We don't know why she's sorry. We don't know what, what she needs to atone for. So, yeah, I think there's a few in there. We don't know what she feels guilty about. We don't know why she's angry. We don't know who sent the email either. So in terms of breadcrumbs early in the book, that's that's a cracker. <laughs> um, Lorraine Peck, The Second Son, take us there. Okay. So this is very early in the book. It's from the point of view of Amy Novak. So she uh, married into a Croatian crime family. Uh, she didn't really know what her husband did, but she likes to keep her head stuck in the sand a little and something bad's happened. 
My hands are numb on the steering wheel. I'm outside Johnny's parents' place and I can't remember getting here. I try to slow my breathing and focus. Every few seconds, it hits me again. Our new reality looping around in my head. Ivan is dead. Alive one moment, dead the next. Probably didn't feel a thing. I guess there are worse ways to die. If I could reset the clock, would Ivan still be alive? Ivan, Johnny's hero, not mine. But I didn't want him dead, did I? Last night, after confirming Johnny was home with me all night, Detective McPherson asked him to help break the news to his parents, Milan and Branca. McPherson is no dummy. I'd want Johnny there as a buffer too. There's a reason Milan has a bad reputation. He's ferocious. He hates cops, and I bet they don't like him much either. Johnny is still with Branca and Milan, and now that Sasha is at school, I need to be with Johnny. But I make no move to get out of the car. I pull the sun visor down and slide open the mirror. A pale face with red-rimmed blue eyes stares back at me. I snap the visor back into place and look over at Branca's garden instead. When Branca and Milan arrived in Australia back in 1980, they bought this single-storey red brick veneer home on the edge of the sprawling suburb of Liverpool. I wonder what the neighbours thought when the Novaks first moved in. My parents would have taken one look at Milan and slapped a for sale sign on their front fence. <laughs> Just before we got married 12 years ago, Johnny and I bought a house of a similar vintage three blocks away. Like most of the other houses in this quiet residential neighbourhood, our place is a triple fronted brick home with a double lock up garage. We have a lawn in the front and a backyard shaded by ghost gums. Oh, and a swimming pool. Ivan's place is three blocks in the other direction. All of us live here in the same area of Liverpool. I know this is normal for most European families, but sometimes I find it very claustrophobic. And that's Lorraine Peck reading from The Second Son. So what crumbs can we see in that scene in terms of the secrets that we discover throughout your novel? What are the clues there? I think I wanted to highlight the cultural difference of um, a, a middle-class Aussie chick marrying into a crime family and uh, because that's, that's one of the questions that really informs the whole book. Uh, and obviously she doesn't like Ivan very much. Um, and Ivan was uh, uh, Johnny's elder brother. And when he's gunned down in the street while he's putting out the garbage bins, as you do when you're a gangster in Western Sydney, you put the garbage bins out, you get gunned down, um, then, then Johnny is tasked with stepping up. So what we find out there is that Amy doesn't have the same hero worship for Johnny's elder brother um, that he does. So that's a crumb, I guess. And if I could reset the clock, yes. she thinks to herself, hmm, I wonder why. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. And I guess in any family, there's, you know, you're getting that sense of the proximity to her extended family, and we wonder what that's about too. But Lin Yao, take us into The Silent Listener. Okay, this is also close to the beginning of the book, and Joy, the protagonist, is um, an adult um, in this scene, and her father has just died, and she's gone looking for something. I stick my hand into the darkness, and my palm hits something sharp. I peer in, and there it is, a solitary nail hammered into wood, and hanging on the nail is a belt, one belt and 10,000 magenta screams. I see my father pushing back his disguises and reaching in for that belt, oblivious to the old screams in there, then later hanging it up delicately, obsessively, oblivious to the new screams. I unhook it and hold it in my hand. It's a simple farmer's belt. Wait, allow me to clarify. Not the belt of a simple farmer, but a simple belt that belongs to a farmer. Correction, belonged, past tense, which tastes delicious on my tongue. The belt is made of plain black leather and has a silver buckle with a silver tongue. That's how they describe it in, say, a criminal trial, but that's only its outward appearance. More accurate for the defence counsel to say, with much emphasising and heavy pauses and gesticulating, yes, members of the jury, just an ordinary, simple farmer's belt. But allow me to tell you what you can't see when you look at this belt. This belt is 35 years long and two children wide. 
and old blood leaks out of every hole, children's blood. Run your fingers down it and feel not leather, but pain. Hold it up to your nose and smell not leather, but fear. Bend it and hear not leather creaking, but children screaming. The people in the gallery would gasp and the jury members would shake their heads appalled if it ever got to trial. This is the first time I've held it. Of course, I've seen it before and heard it hundreds of times, dividing the air above me and felt it exactly the same number of times. Now I am the one holding it and he is the one on the bed, quiet and afraid. Surely he is afraid now that his time has come. I lift it towards my face. The defence counsel was right. The smell of fear burns your nostrils. Lynn Yowett, reading from The Silent Listener. There's something very troubling and immensely effective about your novel, which is the ways in which the secrets at the heart of it, they weren't that hidden. It was more that mm. they were denied or willfully looked away from. So that's very early on in yes. the novel, that scene. And that sense of, um, well, the way that you write fear is so powerful. So whose secrets are they? There are many secrets. So the dead father has secrets that slowly come to light, some of which Joy knows and some which she doesn't know. But Joy is also holding many secrets and doesn't really want anyone to know any of them. But as novels have to do, <laughs> um, we find out what those secrets are and it slowly unfolds. And, yes, this, um, it's almost everybody involved, everybody in the family. And then, yes, this community that decides to deny the truth and just allow things to continue without um, making things better for anybody. So, Lynn, where did this story come from? Mm. <laughs> um, the story is, I say, loosely based on my own family. So the farm that is in the novel is pretty much exactly the farm that I grew up on. So there are certain physical elements of the farm that feature in the book, particularly the dam, which is full of eels and a few other secrets as well. And um, things like a rubbish tank that becomes really important to Joy. Um, we did have a rubbish tank where we put all of our rubbish. There was no such thing as rubbish collection <laughs> where I lived on a remote farm in um, Gippsland in Victoria. And, um, and pretty much the family dynamics that occur in the book are um, what I lived through, I guess, what I experienced as a child. So there are some fairly grim and confronting moments um, in there. But um, I wanted to talk about these and I wanted to raise these issues and talk about the fact that things happen behind closed doors. I guess that's what this book is about, what happens behind closed doors that sometimes people do know about but for various reasons choose not to do anything about. Which makes reading this novel almost a physical experience because you can feel that walking on eggshells and the fear that shapes a family. So, um, so thank you. That is very generous of you for, for sharing that. Thanks, Kate. But just to follow up on the, the way in which some fiction emerges from personal stories and, and personal experiences. So, Lorraine, the second son, how did you imagine your way into this sort of secret or underworld society that you've written about here? Uh, well, I guess I have to... <laughs> I need to talk about my husbands for a moment here. <laughs> um, uh, my, my first husband was a career criminal. He retired uh, before we got married. Um, and then towards the end of our marriage, he went back to America and became reinvolved with his past life and was arrested with 100 kilos of marijuana in Louisville, Kentucky. So that kind of sets the scene a little bit for... Uh, for him as a career criminal. He had actually been heavily involved with moving marijuana from the Sinaloa cartel to the Boston Mafia. So that was his 20s. So when we were learning to work, he was learning how to ship product. And uh, so that informed 
the character of Amy because uh, I was suddenly thrust into a position of having to deal with someone behind, <clears throat> behind bars in America and how to get them out or try to get them out, et cetera. So I was suddenly the wife of a criminal and I didn't think that that would ever happen to me and I felt like I was living in someone else's movie <clears throat> with my hand up against the glass and the telephone, you know. Uh, and my second husband, hopefully my, hopefully my last, my <laughs> darling Stead, is a Croatian and is dyslexic as Johnny Novak is in the book. And he left school at 14 and he became a criminal because there wasn't much left for him as a, uh, a dyslexic young man in the western suburbs of Sydney. He actually thought he was retarded because he couldn't read. And um, luckily he's actually really smart and he smartened up uh, before he turned 18 and changed course and decided to become a successful businessman. So I wondered what would it be like, and by the way, his Croatian family are not criminals, <laughs> none of them, but he definitely was on that path. So I wondered how do you get out if you're born into a crime family and a Croatian crime family became of interest to me because of my relatives <laughs> who were all a bit crazy, uh, how do you get out? That was the question that really drove the book. If you're born into crime, can you ever get out? And there was having an insight into the actual creative process of taking something from your life and turning it into fiction. Now, I'm not going to presume, however, Nicola, that um, the secrets in this book are the secrets of your family. But every family has its secrets, big and small. And I think it was A.S. Byatt in her novel Possession she talked about perennial secrets in storytelling as being questions like, who's the father? Mm -hmm. And in fact, so much literature mm -hmm. is shaped around that secret. Who's the father? Or what happened to the baby? But what made you want to create such an entangled, close family as the site for this novel? I think it's just that uh, every family does have, you know, once you start to delve into the background of your family, grandparents, aunts and uncles, you know, I think almost every family can look back and see that there's all sorts of scandals in the past and so on. And, and I heard stories about my family, um, you know, my grandfather um, and his siblings being shipped off to an orphanage by his mother for a little while because she couldn't look after them. And then eventually getting them back again, once they were at the age where they could work and, um, you know, uh, make money for her and uh, also scandals about um, the, for some of my grandfather and his siblings, we don't actually know who their father was. And there's this scandal about whether it was actually that my uh, great grandmother maybe had an affair with her brother-in-law. And it's just, I feel like there are so many people that I chat to about that kind of story and we'll go, oh yeah, I've got a story, you know, a juicy story from, you know, our background. So it just feels like every family has things hidden. And I don't know if I necessarily set out to give them as many secrets as they, they came out with, but it just sort of grew as I was writing the story because it, I mean, it's all based around a major car accident on Christmas Eve involving this extended family and then uh, works back to the lead up to Christmas to see who's caused this accident, who was driving, who survived and there's all these suspects. So I think just dealing with what was happening in everyone's lives, it just made sense for them to, all these secrets to, to grow and so on. But, um, but yeah, all, all fictional. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm glad you mentioned the um, the car accident because that becomes a sort of structural force for the novel because we see that early on and then it is untangled. But you've all done, you've all made really interesting choices at the very beginning of your novel and these sort of structural things that you've invented as a way to make us think about um, secrets. And Lynn, you've created a device um, a character who we think in different ways about as the book goes on without revealing everything about what you've done. <laughs> so yeah, good luck with this. I'll, I'll just have to check which character you're talking about, but I think I know. <laughs> uh, well, I'm thinking Joy and Ruth. Yes. Um, but perhaps you could talk about 
how you grapple with secrets, what this meant for the way that you had to create a novel. Okay. So while I was writing this book, I read Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca and not, not particularly for any reason. I hadn't read it for many, many, many years. And um, I thought I, for some reason I thought I'm going to reread this book. And what I loved about what um, Daphne du Maurier did with that book was the way that she uses language to deceive readers. So you read the book believing A is the case and at some point later in the novel you realise that in actual fact B is the case. And so I thought that's what I need to do. I need to use the language and the, the dialogue between the characters, so Joy's internal thinking a lot and, um, and the dialogue she has with other characters, including Ruth, her sister, and I need to basically trick you. I need to tell you things in Joy's mind and in the dialogue that you will believe, to make you believe that A is the case when in actual fact B is the case. And so that took a lot of rewriting. I'm just going to say that. Um, after I'd finished the manuscript that um, Penguin bought, I had to revisit almost every dialogue and every um, thought that Joy had and in, in order to effectively trick readers in the nicest possible way, of course. <laughs> um, so for me, it was all about the language. How do I write this to convince you that one thing is happening when in actual fact something else is happening? And then how do I structure it so that everything is revealed at an appropriate time for you to want to keep reading? And, and hopefully feel surprised and, and intrigued and to have um, several twists and several reveals so that um, hopefully you keep saying, oh, my God, I didn't realise that was going to happen and I didn't realise that was the case and, and for that to keep going uh, right up to the last page. It worked. Yeah, it did. You oh. got me. Yeah. <laughs> you Thank you. You're so clever. All of this <laughs> careful mm. thinking that you have to do. Now... Um, Lorraine, one of the things that you do in your novel is tease us at the beginning with a prologue. Hmm. Um, again, without giving away who or why or what's going on. Again, in terms of how you write and how you plan, what does that prologue, where does that sit in the book? I mean, it sits at the beginning, you know what I mean? Where does it sit in your writing process? Okay, my process is very, very messy. And I don't plan anything. I'm a pantser. I wish I wasn't a pantser. I wish I was a planner because, uh, as you just alluded to, Lynn, it means you, a lot of rewriting if you don't plan everything. And uh, during the writing process, uh, I, I started a, a writing course. That's how I, I learned whatever I know about writing I'm just learning along the way but it started with a creative writing course and um, I hadn't written the prologue until probably draft three two or three and it was all around creating um, a really great opening because of course as a writer you want to get your book published <laughs> and in order to get it published, you need to create an incredible opening so that an agent will pick you up and go, yes, I want to, I want to represent you. And then a publisher will say, I want to print your book. And in narrative it. terms, yeah. it also gives a reason for what happened well, yes. and for who'd done it. But did you always know that that was the reason and that was the person? No. <laughs> Not until the very end of writing the book, the first, the first time I wrote the, the first draft, that's when I realised what had happened. Mm -hmm. And so then I wrote the prologue later in the process to give the reader that, you know, frisson of fear when you first open the book, you go, ooh, that's bad. And then, of course, it becomes immediately less frightening. It's not frightening. It's not a frightening book. It's... Um, uh, entertaining I'm hoping not too frightening yes. <laughs> but there is that nasty um, prologue and it's you, you 
I know when I'm reading a book with a, a prologue like that, you keep thinking, so how does the prologue fit in? Like, how does it? And every now and then you're kind of vaguely reminded of, of it, but you still don't know. And then there's that kabam moment when you go, aha, now I get it. I really wanted to create that moment, but it just took me a while to work out how to do it. And when I wrote the prologue, I had, you know, various people say, well, you can't do that. You really cannot open a book that way. And I said, yes, I can. And, and I'm glad I listened to my inner voice. <laughs> Um, Nicola, I think you've got different um, narrative challenges in your novel, which is partly because we've got so many perspectives. Yep. So there's a, a lot of characters with their own secrets, but it begins with one person discovering a car accident. Yes. So can you talk about what it means to write multiple perspectives as well as multiple secrets? Um, I think for me, writing the multiple perspectives just really helped me keep the book going at the times where I might have gotten a bit stuck or, you know, unsure what's going to happen next or, you know, where what's happening in this person's life. I could just jump to somebody else and say, okay, and they would inject new energy into the story for me. And so, and because I kind of structured it as, um, so we kind of open on Christmas Eve with this car accident and then we go back to the beginning of December and we meet all the members of the family in the lead up to Christmas. So it meant that each day when it might be, okay, what's happening on Tuesday, the 5th of December for this character? I don't know. So I'm going to go to this character. And then all of a sudden, something that happened with that character would inform something for the other character and lead into it. So it just kind of kept it going for me because I didn't know kind of similar to yourself, Lorraine, about um, how it was all going to end. I didn't know when I started who caused the car accident and I didn't know who survived the car accident. Um, I did the first scene I wrote was the prologue. I started with that because I like to start with the action um, for myself to kind of get myself excited about the book to go, okay, now I need to write it so I can find out what happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just, I think I, I needed those multiple perspectives, even though I had to be careful with uh, making sure I didn't drive readers um, crazy, trying to keep up with okay, like how many, who. how many people, I think it's four in the end. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's four. So we've got. I should uh, have reread the book. Or myself. is it five? Because we've got the five three in the siblings. There's and the three. Yeah. Um, did I give? I didn't give all siblings a voice. I think I didn't give one of the brothers a voice. So mm. there's a matriarch of the family with three sons who, surprise, surprise, the three sons are all writers. Um, so um, they're not based on anybody I know at <laughs> all. Um, I think I was just trying to think of a job for one of them and went, oh, maybe I'll put a writer into this book. And then all of a sudden I went, what if they were all writers? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's the matriarch of the family, there's her voice, there's two of the sons, no, one of the sons, sorry. One son gets a voice and then two partners get voices. And then there's an extra voice brought in near the end. Yeah, I really should have reread the book before today <laughs> just to remind myself who speaks in this book. I can't remember. Well, it's interesting yes. you said it because one of the characters who doesn't officially have a voice, I had such a strong sense of that I was counting him in my head. Oh, good. So you've you've talked about the the openings and the things that we're setting up. Now, trickily, I want to go to the end and ask how important is it when you write a book with secrets that everything is resolved? Do all secrets need to be revealed for a successful novel? Both, and, and I guess you can either talk about your own book or other reading. So, Lynn, does everything need to be resolved? Yes, unless you've got a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to know Lorraine does. Um, yeah, that's a good question because I, I grappled with that for a bit. I I went through a stage where I thought I'm not going to reveal all of the secrets. I'm going to leave a few things up in the air. But um, when other people were reading drafts of it, they, they found that ultimately unsatisfying. So in the end, I thought, 
you know, much and all, as I think we kind of write books for ourselves because, as Nicola said, you, you need to enjoy writing it, and that's great when you do. But ultimately, you're writing it for the readers, so we have to make it satisfying for you. So in the end, I did resolve all of the um, secrets, although some people disagree on the resolution for a couple of the secrets that are in here, the whodunits and why and so on. Um, and I've thought about when I read other people's books and I think, yeah, I do want to know exactly what went on. You don't need to necessarily wrap it all up in a pretty pink ribbon sort of Hollywood style, but I think we need to make it, yeah, ultimately satisfying for readers so that when they finish it, they feel like they've accomplished something as much as we've accomplished something when we've written it. So, um, yeah, I think the answer is yes. But it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it also makes me wonder for whom is it resolved? Because sometimes it's resolved for us as readers, but not necessarily resolved for the characters. So in some books, we know more than the characters do. Mm. And the other people around don't necessarily know what's happened or why. And, you know, and sometimes I'm very satisfied by an unsatisfying ending. Um, so it's sort of curious. Uh, Lorraine, how important was it to find out who done it and to try to resolve some of the, the secrets? Firstly, I'm just going to ask a question of my own, which is around this. So who here has read The French Lieutenant, Lieutenant's Woman and was really angry at the end when there was, what, three endings you could choose from? That drove me nuts. I hated that. I threw the book down, ran around like this. So, yes, to me it's really important that the major questions within the book are resolved. Uh, however, not necessarily all the action has to be resolved, which is why there's a teeny little cliffhanger at the end of my book which leads to the next uh, just to tantalise you. Uh, but it doesn't, I hope, leave you in any way feeling like I don't know what happened during this time. Uh, but something you should know is that not everything actually is revealed in the second, I mean, the first book. I found out another secret in the writing process of the second book. I discovered another secret. It's like, ooh, I didn't know <laughs> that happened. So, yeah, that's that's kind of a cool process um, and and I'd like to mention a couple of books very quickly that have <laughs> great secrets invested in them The Wife and the Widow Christian White incredible I was just thinking about that one because again it's a structural question yes. about timelines and what you think is happening and the same with The Shadow House Anna Downs timelines are a big part of the secrets involved in that one and Girl 11, Amy Suter Clark, who writes about a true crime podcaster who is actually very much involved in the crimes she's sort of investigating, but you don't know that. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to ask for more examples as we go on, as we talk about the role of secrets in crime fiction, and I think maybe just in fiction, but resolutions and tying up who knows what about which secrets how important is that for you in this novel, Nicola? For me, it's important because I know that when I read a book, I'm the same as you, Lorraine, when it came to throwing down a book with frustration if you don't get that answer that you're after. Um, yeah, I, I want to be satisfied, definitely. So therefore, I treat my books in the same way. Uh, and as Lynn said, I don't think it has to be tied up perfectly and I think I have maybe in the past with my earlier books been guilty of thinking that I need to yeah tie everything up perfectly and I'm sort of have learned throughout my career how to okay it doesn't all have to be perfect you can leave some things as long as yeah you do get those main answers and I definitely felt satisfied with both of your books and as you said if if there's a sequel coming then that's fine leave whatever you want to leave because yeah um, but mine have always always been standalone and I'm happy for people as well to even if you don't quite have all the answers you've got that hope for what's gonna 
happen next. You can kind of envision based on where they're left in their life. You can kind of imagine what's going to happen next for them. So as long as you've got that, I think that's enough. There is at least one secret in your novel, though, that you have left us privy to. Yes. one of the characters and nobody else knows, which Mm. does make you wonder how that is going to play out in the life of that character. Oh, yeah, that character might need some uh, to visit my psychologist maybe. I think I've got a great psychologist, so I think that character could maybe, yeah, have some A good psychologist with a very firm (laughs) non-disclosure, you know, ethics going on, (laughs) I would suggest. (laughs) Is crime fiction always about secrets? How's that for a big question? What do you reckon, Lynn? Yes, secrets and lies. People have to lie and and keep secrets if they've committed a crime or they know someone that they want to protect has committed a crime. Um, Because if the crime novel isn't about the secret, then you'd reveal everything in Chapter 1 and that's not going to work for readers or writers or publishers or booksellers or anybody uh, so, yeah, I think it is. Cent- lies are central. Secrets and lies are central to any anything that we do that's wrong or criminal. And I think we struggle talking about things that we've done that are wrong, and, except perhaps in the context of humour and comedy. Um, but, yeah, I think we, we all, as we've said, we all have secrets and yeah if the crime novel didn't center around those secrets there wouldn't perhaps be much to write about it has to be the unraveling of the truth so um so Lorraine a whodunit is a secret for the reader well for me because I'm not a planner it's a secret for me as well which drives me to find out who done it um but I'm a I'm only a fairly new author I've only written one book and I'm up you know into fairly into the the process of the sequel uh and I didn't know who'd done it with that either until I wrote the first draft so yeah secrets are really important aren't they and uh they are what drive us in lots of ways we all have secrets secrets within the family and so on I'm a sharer so I don't I, I haven't got any really dark, you all know now, you know, that, that my darkest secret is that I was married to a criminal and uh, <laughs> like you all know that now. So I'm a sharer. Everybody keep that to themselves. Yeah, keep it to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> we are in the cone of, cone of silence, okay? But um, my husband, the Croat, is an onion of secrets. There's <laughs> layers and layers. But and how layers. do you know that? <laughs> I can tell by the look on his face and it, it, and I just know he just looks mysterious and I just go oh god damn it there's another secret I'll never know and and that <laughs> does really drive your curiosity doesn't it when you're reading a book and you can sense that maybe that person knows a whole lot more than they're telling us uh, I, I, I think I like that perhaps more than knowing uh, up front more than every more than any of the characters do Although sometimes that's good too. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, as, as you can all see, I've been quite structured in saying, and I've got a question for you and you and you, <laughs> and now is the point at which we get a little more chaotic. And if you want to leap in and respond to things, you know, just go for it. I'll still occasionally be bossy, but, you know, <laughs> that's quite good. Um, crime fiction itself has had, you know, th- there's many different types of crime fiction and we've seen different styles across the years and, and they sort of have diverged. But one of the things that interests me is the way in which on this panel there are cultural secrets and you're dealing with trauma and silences and unspoken grief and the trauma of history and power within families. So um, secrets that are also social issues. I wonder if you could talk about that, Nicola. Oh, yeah. So that becomes... uh more difficult thing to do to introduce into a book when you're yeah dealing with those bigger kind of issues I often incorporate into many of my books um, mental health comes into it a lot for me because it's something that I've been dealing with personally throughout my life so and you often you write what you know Um, and so yeah for a lot of the characters um, 
and I'm, and I'm trying to think as well to how to explain without giving away any spoilers but um yeah things about what's going on within a person their personal struggles their demons um then also domestic abuse comes into it as well all of those kinds of things um are beneath the surface as well and I think that's also a big part of family secrets um is those domestic kind of issues so um yeah I think that's a big part of it yeah and the question of who is allowed to speak their grief or their trauma is um is a secret that I think is particularly well handled um so I mean you've already alluded to this Lynn but what did it mean to you to use this form of crime fiction to deal with the um the sort of cultural silences around things like domestic violence um when I started writing the novel it was very definitely because I wanted people to understand what it was like to grow up in a house that was dominated by fear and abuse and I kind of set out to write a literary I don't know expose and to discuss the long-term ramifications psychological and and otherwise on um, children who are objects of abuse in a family which should be a, a haven and a place you go for love and affection and warmth and so on um, so that was sort of my starting point but as I wrote and kept thinking about what do I like in books and so on I thought I have to I actually have to build in something that people will want to read otherwise it's just going to be a really terribly grim um, bleak, uh, something something that no one will want to read. Um, so uh, that weaving of fact and fiction became really liberating for me and I discovered that by weaving in fiction um, I could uh, do two things. I could make the truth worse and I could also make the truth better. And what I had to go through was sort of a selection process and think, all right, what is it that I want people to experience when they read this? And sure, I want them to understand a bit about um, what it was like growing up in that family. But I love reading and I wanted other people to love reading this too. So I had to think about what am I going to do? What am I going to include? How am I going to structure it? How am I going to reveal the twists and the secrets and the lies? hopefully so that readers enjoy reading it. So I think, you know, maybe we all try and balance out something that's cultural, something that's significant to us in our lives for what, you know, because of our backgrounds or whatever it might be. But we try and balance that out with something that's, yes, yeah, satisfying to read, enjoyable, um, maybe, you know, gasp inducing from time to time so that we kind of take the readers along with us. And so maybe that cultural and cultural side of things combined with that we want to actually entertain people is what we end up producing you know something where those things are blended together and hopefully work really well which I guess is the complicated dynamic of crime fiction itself that you've got propulsive narrative and because it's crime fiction often truly ghastly things happening at the same time mm. that we're also happy to read mm. um look who would like to ask a question bearing in mind that I will also need to pause and restate it to make sure we've got it on the tape and that it can be heard by our friends listening on zoom either a general state of the oh sue we have a question Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. I'm just going to repeat that one. Um, and thank you, because I had forgotten to write down that question. Um, so the question was to Lynn that one of the intriguing things about her novel is the way in which the character Joy sees words as images and often very lateral and just extraordinary images. So where does that come from? Um, Joy has a form of synesthesia, which is a fairly common Oh, well, uh, I think something like 15% of the population have synesthesia where you have uh, you have one sensory input such as a smell or seeing a word or whatever it might be, but your brain registers it in two sensory ways. So Joy, when she sees and hears certain words, she um, has an image appear in her brain. So she has a fairly rare form of synesthesia. I first became interested in synesthesia because my daughter has the common garden variety, which is that 
um, when she sees letters and numbers or each letter and number has a, a, a colour for her. So she ex simultaneously experiences this colour when she sees numbers and words. And after my book was published, I um, one of my brothers read it and he asked me the same question. He said, tell me what's going on with Joy here. So I explained it to him and he said, oh, you mean how every word has a smell? <laughs> and I said, I beg your pardon? And he said, you know, how every word has a smell. And he's 66, I think, and he'd never, ever said this to anybody in his life because he thought everybody experienced a smell when they saw words. <laughs> I said, you've got synesthesia. So, um, and I loved writing about that because I really do love words. <laughs> I'm just, a, I'm a word nerd. And um, I wanted something really joyful for Joy in her life and that ability for her to love words and to experience it was um, was something that I just thought I needed to give joy. And also it gave me a great deal of joy to write. And Thanks, if people Sue. haven't read um, Lynn's book, one example, and if I'm, I'm probably misremembering this, but it might be that a word like langya is um, a duke sitting on a um, velvet lounge leaning backwards. That's and so good. that's the association. So they're very poetic, very inventive. Um, but now, does anybody else have a question? And yes, here's one up the back. Okay, I'm just going to repeat that really wonderful question. Thank you. So Michael says he hasn't read the books and he's interested that given the panel is about dark family secrets, we've talked about the darkness and we've talked about the secrets, but we haven't talked about the role of family in plots. And of course, family are complex things, which might include the darkness, the light, humour. Um, I think, Nicola, yours is the most obviously, well, actually, no, everybody's is centred on family, mm. but yours has the most characters. So we'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love this question. And I think that definitely, I hope that I brought a lot of the light of family, a lot of the, um, especially because it's set leading up to Christmas and there's that feel of, you know, that joyous, festive feeling in the air in December when you're like right now, uh, coming to Christmas and everything feels exciting and so on. So I, I wanted to bring a lot of that into the family. And we've got, you know, there's a family with a teenage daughter, younger daughter, and then baby twins, and then another uh, brother who is dating somebody, and then another brother who's married, but they don't have any children, but the, the wife has... Um, become a bit of a mothering figure to the little girl down the hall so there's lots of you know extended members of this family um, and there is a lot of that history of the three boys going up together growing up together and the yeah fun they've had together as a family so and yeah I did want to also incorporate you know the joy I have as being uh, having lots of siblings in my family and how much I loved growing up with lots of siblings so um, hopefully it's in there that that lighter side of yeah what life is like with your brothers and and sisters and the way you reminisce about oh that time that you know mum and dad did this or we got in trouble for this or like one of our favorite family stories is the time that we left my sister at Pizza Hut and um, drove off and it was you know back in the day where kids just sat on the floor of the car there was no seat belts or anything and there's six kids in our family so we're all crammed into the one car and they just did noticed that Fiona wasn't in the back of the car mm -hmm. and dad apparently drove through car parks and through red lights to get back to pick her up because she was like I don't know six or seven or something so and she was pretty mad by the time they got back to pick her up <laughs> um, but those kind of old family stories I think um, yeah adds a lot to um, uh, to the characterization and to just bringing those moments of lightness in amongst the all the dark down things that are happening so that you know as you said you don't want the book to just be constantly uh, a drag to get through you need there to be those lighter moments mm. and I remember the moment in your book when I finally was able to go yes <laughs> it was such a joyous moment <laughs> you know because it, it, it's dark mm. and and mm. you know sorry those moments are really important and you nailed that thank you 
And we're on to something here with the families. In fact, one of my next questions I had written down here was, uh, Nicola, how much yours was about what we might do for those we love. But um, there's a question that came in on Zoom. Um, how do all of you as authors feel about their families reading what might be based on their lives? <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps Lorraine, your, um, your new extended um, Croatian family. Well, I've always made it very obvious in every public event that the crime family depicted the Novaks are not actually Stead's family. Uh, but, yeah, if I can just hark back very briefly to Michael's question um, as well. I know I'm being talking out of school here, but it, for me it was very important that um, Johnny Novak, who is the second son, uh, born in a crime family, born into the darkness and reared on violence. Like that was how you solve problems. It was with your, a gun or your fists. And uh, I really wanted him to go from the darkness into the light because you, you know, people kept saying, so is he like Michael Corleone? And, you know, obviously it's a gangster family. So, yes, there has to be some uh, comparison with... Um, uh, the Corleones and Michael Corleone goes from the light very much into the darkness sorry Lynn uh, so I really wanted to take Johnny on an, an opposite journey I don't quite succeed but he <laughs> he is uh, he is a there is a light of goodness in him throughout but you'll have to buy it now and read it Michael won't you? <laughs> Um, Lynn, perhaps a, a sort of combination of those two questions, depending on what's difficult or, yeah. or not to answer. Um, mm -hmm. um, I have two brothers, and so slightly different um, family structure to what's in the novel. And um, so we all had a yeah, fairly hard childhood. But so I don't know whether I'm actually answering either of these questions, but I'm just going to say this anyway. Um, but we all have a, a very... Um, optimistic and um, I'm going to say fun-loving kind of attitude. So I always think it's amazing how many crime writers are just the loveliest people. And we were chatting before about how supportive crime writers are of each other. It's just a really amazing community. Um, and they go home and dream about murders. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Um, but what, one day when I was with my brother, both my brothers and one of my sisters-in-law, we were laughing and my sister-in-law said, gee, you know, I know what happened to you guys when you were young. And she said, I can't help but think that every time the three of you are together, all you do is laugh. So we didn't grow up very close. Um, so there are a few years between us and for various reasons, uh, well, we all left home very, very early. And um, I actually didn't see either of my brothers for many years to the point that when one of them knocked on my front door once, I, I literally did not know who he was. Um, so we've had this very, um, I guess, you know, difficult background to deal with. But the three of us, um, A, we all agree on our childhoods, which is very important, I think, for siblings, because I'm sure we know some sort of famous siblings who don't agree on what happened in their family. We do agree about what happened to us. And um, so I, I think we have this bond. So while we might have had a fairly dark childhood, I think our friendships now are are quite um, very important to us in terms of bringing light and maintaining light in our lives. Um, and I forget the other question, but maybe that's... You answered, answered them it. both beautifully and you've led us from dark family secrets into a lighter space. So here at the Bad Sydney Crime Festival and on ABC Radio National, I'm Kate Evans and you've been listening to writers Nicola Moriarty, Lynn Yowett and Lorraine Peck. Please do thank them.